thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to Town Hall for hosting. Uh, thank you to Red May. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to what is by far the most exquisite hall I've ever done a talk in. Um, uh, one uh, tiny little correction to that lovely um, introduction. I'm one of the founding editors of Salvage. Uh, our editor-in-chief, Rosie Warren, is in fact here today. And anyone who's interested in uh, in our publication, I would encourage you to chat to her as well as to me. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, read something, and I'm going to do something I don't normally do, which is I'm going to read from the end of the book. Um, and that is because, unfortunately, in this case, uh, the question of spoilers is somewhat redundant. Um, <laughs> tragically, you know, spoiler alert, it doesn't go well. Um, there is an extent to which this, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very honored and, and, and grateful to you for coming, uh, for so many people for coming, partly because I'm aware that this book is clearly something of a, of, of, a, um, uh, of a move away from what a lot of people may associate with me, because this is a non-fiction book, and this is a, this is a narrative fiction. And my, my line about this book is uh, perfectly true, is that it is, this is not, a narrative fiction for leftists. It's a narrative fiction for everyone. However, it is a narrative fiction for everyone written by a leftist. Um, and that those politics and that analysis are clearly uh, it, throughout the book in various ways. But they really come out to some extent in the ending because the story of 1917, this epochal year, is haunted by ghosts from the future which is what happens. And it would be craven and unrealistic not to engage with those. Um, and therefore, in the epilogue, there is a uh, necessarily gestural and brief um, engagement with some of, those, some of those issues. And what that means is that both in its approach, its focus, and its, its tone, its tenor, it is somewhat different from the rest of the book. Nonetheless, I'm going to read uh, several short excerpts from that, which I've kind of uh, coagulated into one sort of um, uh, nine minute reading to give you an idea of the, um, the haunting, um, I think, that uh, is there throughout the rest of the book. That strange book, What is to be Done, casts a long shadow. In 1902, Lenin named his own seminal tract on leftist organization after the novel of 40 years previously. Nikolai Chernyshevsky's story is interspersed with dream sequences of which the most celebrated is the fourth. Here, the protagonist, Vera Pavlovna, journeys from the ancient past to a strange, affecting, utopian future. The hinge point of the book, the fulcrum from history to possibility, is the fourth dream's section seven. And that section, in its entirety, is two rows of dots, something ostentatiously unspoken the transition from injustice to emancipation. Behind the extended ellipsis, readers understood, lay revolution. With such discretion, the author evaded the censor. But there is something almost religious, too, in this unwriting from this atheist son of a priest, a political via negativa, a negative way. Apophatic theology considers God as beyond words, as unspeakable. Here is an apophatic revolutionism. For those who cleave to it, a paradox of actually existing revolution is that in its potential for utter reconfiguration, it is precisely beyond words, a messianic interruption, but one that emerges from the quotidian. Unsayable, yes, but the culmination of everyday exhortations. Chernyshevsky's dots, then, a one iteration of the strange story of revolution. And after that wordlessness in the novel comes an immediate, urgent gasp. Oh my love, now I know all your freedom. I know that it will come. But what will it be like? That question, from this point in history, can only hurt. Late evening of the 26th of October, 1917, Lenin, stands at last before the Second Congress of Soviets, the councils of workers and soldiers convened as the insurrection began. He's kept his audience waiting. Applause rolls over him. At last he bends forward <clears throat> and in a hoarse voice speaks his first famous words to the gathering. 
we shall now proceed to construct the socialist order that provokes delight. And what of the hated, miserable war? Congress issues a proclamation to the peoples and governments of all the belligerent nations, calls for an immediate negotiation towards democratic peace. The war is ended, comes a hushed exclamation. The war is ended. Delegates are sobbing. They break, not into celebratory, but funereal song, honoring those who have died in the struggle for this moment. But the war is not yet ended, and the order constructed in Russia will be anything but socialist. Instead, the months and years that follow will see the revolution embattled, assailed, isolated, ossified, broken. We know where this is going. Purges, gulags, starvation, mass murder. There have been a hundred years of crude and ahistorical bad faith attacks on October. Without echoing such sneers, we must nonetheless interrogate the revolution. The old regime was vile and violent. Russian liberalism was weak and quick to make common cause with reaction. All the same, did October lead inexorably to Stalin? It is an old question, but one still very much alive. Is the gulag the telos of 1917? Its degradation was not a given, was not written in any stars. Revolutionary Russia was born embattled, traduced and conspired against. It is soon shattered by famine and bloodied by a civil war of unimaginable barbarism. By 1919, it is occupied by American, French, British, Japanese, German, Serbian, and Polish troops. The red virus is more irksome to the Allies than are their wartime foes. Churchill is particularly obsessed with the nameless beast, the foul baboonery of Bolshevism and explicit that it is his greatest enemy. As the war ends, he proclaims his intention to kill the Bolshe, kiss the Hun. And the revolutions in Europe, on which the Russian revolutionaries had staked their moves, did not come or came, but were defeated. And, too, those who count themselves on the side of the change must engage with what followed, including the revolutionaries' failures and crimes, the repeated recasting of terrible necessities as virtues. To do otherwise is to fall into apologia, special pleading and hagiography, and to risk repeating mistakes. It is not for nostalgia's sake that the strange story of the first socialist revolution in history deserves celebration. The standard of October declares that things changed once and they might do so again. For an instant, there is a new kind of power. Fleetingly, a shift towards workers' control of production and the rights of peasants to the land. Equal rights for men and women in work and marriage, to divorce, maternity support, the decriminalization of homosexuality a hundred years ago. Moves towards national self-determination, free and universal education, the expansion of literacy, a cultural explosion, a thirst to learn, the mushrooming of universities and lecture series and adult schools, a change in the soul as much as in the factory. And though those moments are snuffed out, reversed and become bleak jokes and memories all too soon, it might have been otherwise. It might have been different because these were only the first and most faltering steps. The revolutionaries want a new country in a new world, one they cannot see but believe they can build and they believe that in so doing, the builders will also build themselves anew. It would be absurd to hold up October as a simple lens through which to view the struggles of today. But it has been a long century, a long dusk of spite and cruelty, the excrescence and essence of its time. And even remembered twilight is better than no light at all. It would be equally absurd to say that there is nothing we can learn from the revolution, to deny that the sumerki of October, that word means both twilight and the darkness before dawn, to deny that that can be ours and that it need not always be followed by night. It is beneath our dignity to be shot down here in the street by switchmen. One anti-revolution politician shouts as his way is calmly blocked by radical sailors, 
on October's night. What he meant by switchmen, says one witness, the American journalist John Reed, I never discovered. There is a probable answer in an unlikely place. Many years later, in his memoir, Der Mamas Shabosim, My Mother's Sabbath Days, the great Lithuanian Yiddish writer Chaim Grade records that the area around the switchmen's booths along the railroad tracks was the clandestine meeting place for revolutionaries. It seems then that the word had become a disdainful epithet for them. What or who could be more inimical to all those convinced that there is one ineluctable root of history, that Russia was not ready for the revolution, if it would ever be, than those who take account of the sidings and alternate tracks of history, or who even take to them. 1917 is a revolution of trains, history proceeding in screams of cold metal. The Tsar's wheeled palace, shunted onto sidings forever. Lenin's sealed, stateless carriage, trains crisscrossing Russia, heavy with desperate deserters. The engine stoked by an escaping Lenin in disguise, eagerly shoveling coal. Revolutions, Marx said, are the locomotives of history. Put the locomotive into top gear, Lenin exhorted himself in a private note, scant weeks after October. Keep it on the rails. But how to keep it there if there is one true way, one line, and your opponents, including on the left, tell you that it is blocked? In 1937, Bruno Schultz writes of events that have no place of their own in time. The possibility that all the seats within time might have been sold. Conductor, where are you? Don't let's get excited. Have you ever heard of parallel streams of time within a two-track time? Yes, there are such branch lines of time, somewhat illegal and suspect, but when, like us, one is burdened with contraband of supernumerary events that cannot be registered, one cannot be too fussy. Let us try to find at some point of history such a branch line, a blind track onto which to shunt these illegal events. There is nothing to fear. By the forest shacks are the points, the switches onto hidden tracks through wilder history. And the question for history is not only who should be driving the engine, but where. Onto such tracks, the revolutionaries divert their train with its contraband cargo, unregisterable, supernumerary, powering for a horizon as far away as ever, and yet careering closer. Or so it looks like from the liberated train, in, in Ossip Mandelstam's words, liberty's dim light. Thank you. That is the end of October. Thank you, China. Thank you all for being here. Again, I'm Monica Guzman. I'm the co-founder and editor of The Evergrey. It's a daily Seattle newsletter. And I'm thrilled to be here with China tonight. Um, thank you to Town Hall. Thank you to all of you. I want to get a sense before we get started of who's in the room. Um, I heard a lot of cheers for Red May, so I think I already know the answer to this question. Who would consider themselves to be left, 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 or socialist curious? Raise your hand at the very least. Quite a lot of you, all right. And who is a fan of China's work uh, in weird fiction and is kind of wondering what this Russia thing's all about? Okay, all right, so that's actually a pretty even split. So that, that's interesting. So um, we're sure to alienate at least half the audience. Is that the, yeah. uh, that's the probable calculus, is it? Yes, is that, I guess okay. so. Um, so. So let's start with, with this. Uh, you're an incredible storyteller. I've, I've read your, your fiction. You can make up stories really quite well. This story is not made up, but you saw it worthy of really painstaking research and painstaking detail. And, and it's clear that it's not just, to you, important history, but also uh, just a good story. So tell us, why was this story in particular? To, to you, so worth telling, so something you had to tell? Um, 
Well, you're, you're right. It is, as, as well as everything else, it is an extraordinary story. And um, the, the genesis of this book goes back a few years, probably about three years or so, where uh, in, in a conversation between myself and the editor, Sebastian Budgen of Verso Books, um, and we uh, decided that there would be, well, frankly, what we thought was going to happen was that there was going to be lots and lots of books telling narrative histories of 1917, because irrespective of your politics, it's a incredible epochal year and that this was the centenary coming along and you know we thought that this story was going to be told um, and we thought that it was important to tell that story in an attempt to kind of negotiate between as you say the simple extraordinary narrative sweep of it the unbelievable in some cases events um, to do so uh, unabashedly from a kind of political point of view, but not reducing it to a polemic so that it's, a, it's also told as a story for anyone who's interested. Um, uh, my, my line on this, with apologies for repetition, is that this is not a history for leftists, it's a history for anyone, but it is a history for anyone by a leftist, um, which is the negotiation of that. Um, and, uh, you know, being very unabashed about that and kind of bringing out those aspects, because it is also, I think, for me and for him, uh, and for many people here, perhaps, uh, a, a point of, of great political inspiration as well. The coda to this story is that, in fact, there have been, as far as I can find out, no other narrative histories of 1917, wow. which is... Why? Uh, Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because there has been a pretty successful decades-long ideological project of reactionary forgetting. Um, uh, because 1917 is, among many other things, um, uh, you, you know, an inspiration uh, for people who want to essentially radically change the status quo. And those who are particularly committed to the status quo would therefore, you know, if they have to, they would denigrate it. But the best thing they could do is simply encourage everyone to forget about it. Yeah. And you, you, you said earlier that Russia, I mean, could this conversation be happening in Russia? Talk to us about how that country looks at its own epochal moment. Well, I mean, certainly the conversation is happening in Russia, but it's happening on kind of local levels among radical groups and among, you know, some people who are kind of interested in, uh, in the history, you know, for, for, for particular reasons, primarily, I think, political reasons, with, with some exceptions. At an official level, no, there's a, there's, a, there's a series of very peculiar paradoxes, which is that this is, again, leave aside the politics, this is uh, an event um, which has completely shaped the cultural and geopolitical and domestic political shape of the world we live in. So irrespective of your uh, re relationship to it, one would think that it was kind of worthy of, 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 of commemoration. The Russian government um, is... Uh, for them, 1917 is, you know, is, is an embarrassment, um, and it is not being officially commemorated at all, um, as far as possible not being mentioned. But there is a, there is a peculiar paradox about this. Oh, sorry, just a little anecdote. When I was, I was in St. Petersburg doing research for the book, and uh, I was asking Russian friends and comrades, you know, if, if, it is, if they are put in a position where they have to relate to the revolution, if you talk to an apparatchik of... Putin and his clique, and you say, well, what do you, you know, just explain 1917 to me, what happened in your opinion? And they, you know, what will they do? And they thought about it, and then one of them said, well, what they'll say is, there was a sort of tragic argument, there was a sort of, you know, there was a, there was a terrible, it was a real shame, there was a big uh, tussle, and then in the end, Russia won. Um, and that's the way you negotiate this, and that is exactly why Lenin is uh, persona non grata, because he was disgusted by Russian chauvinism. And that also explains why the same people who are attempting to forget October completely, many of them are actually very nostalgic for Stalin. Because Stalin, conversely, was a great Russian chauvinist. Um, and so you, you have this peculiar paradox. Final thing on this, there is going to be a massive commemoration next year, because that's the centenary of the killing of the Romanovs. And the end of the Tsar, Putin considers that a very tragic thing that absolutely does need commemoration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so many places to go. Um, I'll, I'll confess to this group, I knew next to nothing about the Russian Revolution before I read this book. And I'll say that it's, the narrative is just so well paced. You can tell where things get really momentous because your writing becomes this poetic, just narrative, just force. And it just propels you through 
marching over ice-covered lakes and the blood and oh my gosh, it's just, it's so felt. Um, and you had a lot of, you had your heroes, right? Lenin, um, Trotsky, Kerensky in a way, this chief persuader. I, I want to ask you about the ending and the narrative itself. Um, and for, for those of you who have, you haven't read it or may not be familiar with the revolution, it's kind of two revolutions, right? Big event in February that takes the Tsar out of, out of power and a big event in October that establishes socialism as, as the power in, in society. So what, I'm quite kind of, what is the, what is the gap between how people today for the most part, let's say Americans or the world at large, remembers this and what you are bringing to the table? Well, first of all, I want to, in terms of the question of heroes and villains, you're absolutely right. I do come to this, and I say this in the book, quite frankly, you know, I am partisan, I have my heroes, I have my villains, I've attempted to be open-minded and not uncritical, so those people who I admire, I've certainly attempted not to uh, blur the fact when I think they make, you know, terrible mistakes or they're wrong or whatever. Also, in certain cases, people that I didn't know were going to end up being heroes ended up being heroes, so for me, for, for, for the Russian revolutionary nerds, Maria Spiridonova, the great leader of the left socialist revolutionaries, uh, not uh, nearly as remembered today as she was at the time, amazing figure. And the final thing I want to say is, Kerensky is an interesting figure. You mentioned Kerensky as a hero. Uh, what I've described him as is, a, I have a kind of narrative affection for Kerensky. Politically. Can you, can you introduce him really quickly? Yeah. Yeah. Kerensky is, Kerensky, well, Kerensky, is, he considers himself, particularly at the beginning of the year, a socialist of some sort on the left, and he's a, uh, associated with, uh, ultimately, with a party called the Socialist Revolutionaries, who are oriented towards the peasants. But, essentially, he ends up running the provisional government, which is the, uh, the sort of nascent government uh, after the overthrow of the Tsar, which is counterposed to the Soviet, which is a kind of grassroots dem democratic organ, which exists in oscillation for some months. The thing about Kerensky, for me, uh, Kerensky is the most extraordinary figure, and politically, I am light years away from him. And I think that, you know, ultimately, he always made common cause with the most brutal reaction. And, uh, you know, so I, I am his implacable political foe. From the point of view of storytelling, I cannot not have affection for him because he's just so extraordinary. You can tell um, the way you write about him. He's a yeah. genuinely amazing figure. And I think. Can I swear in this venue? I don't know what the policies are. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. So one of the things about Kerensky, like, my, you know, who knows? I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not telepathic, let alone historically telepathic. But my sense of Kerensky is that unlike a lot of people in the kind of cynical milieu, I think Kerensky really did believe his own bullshit. And this is an interesting thing about him. He is this very strange man, com convinced of his own messianism, that he can kind of bring Russia to salvation. Um, and he becomes this kind of tottering clown um, and some, you know, w wandering around in strange disguises and having kind of histrionic fits and making himself faint with his own speeches and so on. And there's a little part of me, I can't, to, to, to the leftists in the room, I can't defend this politically, but there's a little part of it when I'm reading these anecdotes about Kerensky or writing them and I'm like, oh, Kerensky, <laughs> I, <can't, laughs> I can't stay mad at you. you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so telling it as a story is um, you end up with peculiar kinds of affection. And this does actually dovetail to a certain extent with the question you're asking about the differentiation. There is a, I mean, essentially I think for me it, um, it boils down to one thing, because I could talk about this for hours, but one thing I think is, is, is key for me in terms of the difference between this narrative um, and, and the narrative that I touch on in the epilogue, which in some ways, as I say, the tenor is different and it has more of an overt political analysis than the rest of the book. But I, you know, I do not believe that the degeneration and counter-revolution after 1917 was inevitable, and I have my reasons for saying that, and, in fact, and I think that it, you know, the, the revolution was you know, this, this ruptural point of intense inspiration. I not only don't mind, I welcome serious, good-faith debates with including right-wing historians, conservative historians who are actually prepared to have the, the debate and the discussion and explain why they do think that the degeneration was inevitable or whatever. What I cannot bear is the approach of so many liberals 
who perform what I think of as analysis by aphorism, where they go, ah, revolution, so tragic that it always eats its young. Or something, some vacuous nonsense, which is completely an evasion of any kind of analysis. So what I can't bear is the notion that this is a given, that this is essentially a kind of tragic narrative written in the stars, that this was always the way. So I welcome actually having the debate. So what I hope differentiates my approach politically to the revolution to that of, if you like, the kind of uh, default liberal nostrums um, is, is that it actually wants to interrogate the specificities and concretenesses of Russia at that time, politically, economically, and, and, um, and, and actually track out what happened. Right. I have much more respect for serious critics than I do for the kind of hand-waving tragedians. Well, I'll, I'll tell you as a lay reader, maybe one of the saddest things about reading this narrative and then knowing where it ultimately went, both in memory and in reality, is that there's, there was a lot, an awful lot about how this all went down in Russia that was so strikingly democratic. It was people, peasants, people who couldn't read, waking up, um, just becoming active and so engaged. Um, you wrote at one point um, about the, you know, the government officials reading the, the writing of people who really couldn't write but were so trying to communicate what they wanted because they felt around them this incredibly charged moment where we can actually rise up. We can actually take power, there's hope here. And to me, it's just the saddest thing that the narrative becomes, that's what happens when, 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 when a society tried this in a really amazing way, where so many people just woke up. And I, I told China over email, like, I can't believe that there was ever a time when 500,000 people could protest in a city, like, and that could be planned in a couple of days before Facebook, like, how could that happen? <laughs> but it did. Uh, this was an incredibly active, engaged country, and look where it ended up. Well, I think the most moving aspect of this for me is that you have, uh, you know, an enormous, uh, enormous, territory and population, because we're not just talking about Russia, we're talking about the Russian Empire, we're talk and that tr I try to bring that in as much as possible. We're talking about, you know, Azeris and Lithuanians and Poles and Latvians and, and so on and so on, like across the empire. And for centuries, but um, particularly in, in various ways, uh, in a kind of defensive way since 1905, when there was an earlier, uh, uh, a kind of what Trotsky called a dress rehearsal for the revolution. Um, what you have is this enormous mass of people, and those at the top, what they're, what they're saying is like, you know, it is your lot to, to not have any power over your own life, uh, and, and, and to want to have power over your own life, you will be punished for that desire. And after February, which is when the Tsar is overthrown, as you say, kind of pre-Facebook, pre-Twitter, um, what you have is this explosion of letter writing. This is a year characterized by floods and floods of letters, and they are the most moving documents of the revolution you can possibly imagine, because as you say, you're talking about villages and uh, units at the front and so on, of whom maybe one person in 10 or more is, is actually literate. So these are literally communally written letters where one person is, dictate, is being dictated to by everyone, and they are, uh, you know, desperate um, desires for more, not, like they're writing to any name they've heard of. So they like, they find like the name of a, of a famous politician and they will write to them um, and they will sort of say, we've heard about a, a party called the Bolsheviks or the Mensheviks or whatever, could you please send us any information? And in some cases, this is almost like, you know, writing to Rex Tillerson or something and saying, you know, what is this international socialist organization I've heard so much about? You know, like just <laughs> desperate to get knowledge, you know, sending tiny sums of money that they've collaborated together to get to get hold of left literature um, and uh, increasingly as the year goes on through June, July and August these utterly wrenching letters um, which are expressing often in a very religious tone because it's a deeply religious country and this has becomes a vehicle and a way of expressing a whole range of, of, of motives. This sense of apocalypse um, diverted, this sense that February was a millennial rupture, was uh, a movement towards, you know, a kind of the kingdom of God, a, a city on the hill, and that it has been taken, and that there's this kind of desperate reaching for uh, apocalypse, for revolution, in a way that I find, I mean, I can barely read them without getting choked up, you know. Yeah. So, 
it isn't merely a question of, you know, these important political things happened that radicals did. It is absolutely a question of a sudden engagement in, you know, uh, not just political ideas, cultural ideas, at, at a mass level among people who had been denigrated and, uh, you know, and condescended to for, uh, you know, decades and centuries. So let's talk about hope, hope for a minute, political hope because that also is very present in the book. It's the, the, the socialists had this hope that there was gonna be a global socialist revolution that was going to make their revolution sustainable. They also had this hope early in the year that the, correct me if I'm wrong, that the bourgeoisie, right, the liberals would work together with them and that they would hold power for a while before you know, the socialists and the proletariat would really be able to hold power. Um, that's a, that's a lot of, that was a lot of hope. I mean, as I read that, I thought, goodness, that's a lot of counting on these other things to happen. And what, what do you make of just that force of, yeah. of hope in politics? Well, the socialists in Russia, and we're not just talking about the Bolsheviks, we're talking about a whole range of different groups, um, were very, very split precisely on the question. Well, I mean, among themselves as well, there was enormous debates in all different directions, but what the, one of the key things they were split on was precisely this question of whether or not you could and should work with the liberals. And I, I, glance, I, I sort of gesture towards this in the reading and in more depth in the book itself, in the epilogue, which goes into this a bit, um, and indeed the prologue, which is essentially the two great wings of Russian Marxism, the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. To put it very crudely, and, and there are many nuances within these positions, I want to be clear about that. The Mensheviks essentially said, you can't have socialism until you've got properly advanced liberal capitalism. We're not yet at a kind of advanced liberal capitalist country. We, you know, the liberals, the bourgeoisie have to take power and we need to be a kind of left uh, voice trying to push this in as progressive a direction as possible. Whereas the Bolsheviks ultimately, not initially, but ended up, and, and not just the Bolsheviks, the, you know, in, in different ways, the left SRs as well, ended up taking a position where no, um, you know, we cannot trust the liberals, we cannot trust the bourgeoisie, we have to take power. So that was, that was one of the key distinctions. When you talk about hope, I think the metaphor I would use more immediately was, uh, was a wager. You know, that this was, especially in the case of the, of, of the revolutionaries themselves who, who pushed for October, that this was a wager that there, this will spread and there will be support. So yes, there's elements of hope to it, but in, in the best cases, it's a calculated uh, gamble based that, you know, the doing of this will actually change the field of possibility and reality such that we will then be supported. For me, in fact, one of the problems becomes, if you like, uh, I mean, hope is, uh, I think hope is, hope is very Yanis faced and this is something that I think the left including today, doesn't engage with enough, is that hope can be your enemy as much as your, as much as your comrade and your ally. Now, for me, as an example, as a key example, in 1924, the Bolshevik Party overturned, because the international revolutions didn't happen, they, or, sorry, or were defeated, I should say, in some cases, they overturned uh, years of theory and said quite abruptly, okay, we can have socialism in one country. Now this was a complete vault fast. This was an absolute revision of a theory. And for me, it was an expression of what I call bad hope, which was a kind of disavowed panic because the wager hadn't paid off. The wager had, it was a, it was a completely reasonable wager to make. It, you could easily say it was the only thing you could do. When it failed, what you don't then do is say, oh well, okay, anyway, it's gonna be fine. And to be clear, my position is that there was no good way out of this situation. So what you're looking at is least bad ways out of the situation. And my position is that in that situation, the least bad situation would have been a kind of rigorous political pessimism where you say, in the short and medium term, our wager on the international level did not succeed. What is the least bad political way we can go from here? The moment you start saying, you know, well, because the, the thing about socialism in one country is completely unconvincing. It has the whiff of panic about it. And what it ended up doing was accelerating terrible, curdling tendencies within the politics themselves, including the politics of the revolutionaries. And you see it, as I mentioned, in this awful tendency to make a virtue of a necessity. Terrible things you have to do, and then you say, well, that's socialist culture. No, it's not. It's an expression of catastrophe and weakness, even if you think you had to do it. 
One of the few things that, I'm very nervous of making glib analogies. I think it's a really bad idea, but there are certainly resonances. And one of the resonances for me, I can talk about this at more length, I, I don't want to go on too much, but just very briefly here, I think that certainly the British and American left um, has been hamstrung by treating hope as a point of principle rather than treating it as a potential end result of rigorous analysis. And in fact, the notion that you lose people to pessimism, I think we've lost more people to bad hope and to failed hope than we've lost to kind of rigorous, serious, unflinching pessimism. I am very politically pessimistic at the moment, uh, and I have never felt more politically engaged and energized. Oh, and I think we have to stop being scared of that. Give me, give me an example of bad hope in action today. Uh, today? Um, <laughs> There's How probably long have you many. Got? Um, um, well, for example, <laughs> you see, I mean, any time, um, for example, when, when Theresa May um, announced the snap election in the UK, those of us on the left in Britain have been extremely energized and excited and downright joyful at the, at the utterly unexpected, uh, initially, um, rise of Corbyn. I mean, it's a genuinely game-changing phenomenon, and for all the, you know, comradely arguments we might have about this or that policy, and those are very important, you know, this is game-changing. Um, and immediately in the aftermath of the, election, uh, of, of the election call, there were those on the left who were sort of saying, great, this is great, one push, you know, we can win this, we can win this, and it's like, that's not helping, because we face an absolute mountain. That does not mean that we should be quiescent. It doesn't mean that we surrender. What it means is the only way we are gonna get out of this with our hearts and souls intact is to say, let's be very clear about the scale of what faces us now in a poisonous and toxic political atmosphere that Corbyn heroically has been pulling against with some success, but in the aftermath of, you know, of uh, the Syriza catastrophe, in the aftermath of the uh, Scottish independence, in the aftermath of Brexit, um, in the aftermath of, uh, you know, of this kind of, you know, incredible, of UKIP and the recrudescence of a, you know, a really frightening turn to the right. It is not about saying that there's no point doing anything. It is about saying we are embattled and we fight as if we are embattled because otherwise we are gonna be really upset when actually we manage to do something pretty amazing by clinging on, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's one, you know, and as it happens, you know, Corbyn is doing thus far, that's a hugely important caveat, he's doing better than many of us expected and that's wonderful to be, cautious to the point of pessimistic does not mean cutting yourself off from joy. In fact, it means being able to experience joy because if you go in with a kind of dogged optimism a priori, then everything is always a bad surprise if it's not the best possible outcome. <laughs> so that's just one example. Yeah. So, so speaking of being embattled, right, and 100 years ago in Russia, this, this agitation, we're clearly in that moment now. So I'm just gonna break the ice and say the name Donald Trump. So now we've said the name, and we can start talking about, all right, all right, we're gonna do it. Um, we can just start talking about the moment we're in. So after your intense research into the Russian Revolution, this, this time of incredible agitation, uh, here in Seattle, there's just been this renaissance of people who normally would not be involved in politics and really across the country. What, what lessons does the Russian Revolution teach this moment about how public political agitation works? I will say two things, and I, again, I want to preface this with this very important caveat, which is that I think another thing that I think does not help the left is a kind of reductive analogizing, where, you know, you pick your favorite revolution and you go, as then, so us, you know, um, and, and I, 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 have, I have called this the cosplay left, you know, this notion that you kind of... <laughs> Did you, you say the you, cosplay you, yeah, left? Yeah, you dress up as your favorite revolution. So awesomely and geeky, I love yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and this, it, it, is, it is a kind of reenactment, it's, kind of, um, it's a kind of game, and, I, and I, think it's, I think it's actively unhelpful. That is not to say at all that one doesn't learn lessons, but the point about is, you know, learn, you know, reading the lessons, if you like, in their context, and then 
doing a kind of sometimes quite difficult and serious job of kind of, uh, of, of um, mediation and working out, you know, how, what, how can we learn these lessons? Uh, how, what, what can we not, sorry, I shouldn't even say that. You can see how well trained I've been in the traditions from which I'm now chafing. You know, not like how, how can, you know, how do we apply these lessons? What are these lessons? You know, what, do, what can we gain from this? I think, so, so that's an important caveat because I don't want to suggest that you can read, read off like some kind of master code. What I do think, I would say, I would say there are, two, there are two things that I think that I took very much in terms of the reading and the research and the writing. One is that um, as a movement, as a kind of institution, liberalism ultimately will always make peace with reaction. Now, I want to be clear about what I'm saying here. What I'm not saying is all liberals are always going to betray you. That's not true. You know, there are very honorable and sincere and, you know, people whose politics are some way to the right of me, but who will absolutely fight and come out on the set, you know, uh, and, and, and that's, I want to be clear about that. What I'm saying is as an organized institution, let alone as a kind of bureaucratic set, as a set of sort of bureaucratic organizations and norms, you know, liberalism is committed ultimately, it, it is more scared of radical change than it is of a status quo. So either with tears in its eyes or with a sadistic grin, it will ultimately betray um, um, the, the, the drive for radical social change. And I want to be, I mean, I'm using liberalism, liberal in a very particular way here, you know, a very specific way as opposed to kind of radical left um, and, and as opposed to those who are fighting for fundamental social change. There is an analogy I've used before, uh, sorry, not an analogy, uh, 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 an analysis here by uh, my friend and salvage co-editor, Richard Seymour, who I recommend his work very, very strongly to anyone who hasn't read it. Um, and he said once, some years ago, that essentially there are, two, there are two kinds of liberals. There are liberals who are liberals because they have fidelity to liberal ideas, and there are liberals who are liberals because they have fidelity to the liberal state. People who have fidelity to liberal ideas may well become very sincere and important and committed uh, comrades in activism. They may be part of a serious movement for change, not least because liberalism as an institution will never deliver the ideas that it says it's committed to. So they will in fact end up becoming opposed to those systems. Those who are liberals because they have fidelity to the liberal state will never fight for radical change and will always ultimately make common cause with the enemies of radical change. So that was one lesson. And the other one I think for me is that history is not a mere kind of endless recursion of the same. And I don't just mean radical social change is possible, although I do mean that. I also mean it in a kind of negative sense. One of the things that comes up again and again in the study of Russia in 1917 is, as I've mentioned, this very explicit sense of apocalypticism. You know, and obviously this is partly to do with the war, which is going on at the time, but not only that, the, the collapse of society, the sense that we are in an apocalypse. And I think I take that very seriously as a kind of, as a diagnostic reading of the world in which you live. The fact that right now I, among many other people, feel more apocalyptic than I have felt in my entire political life, I don't think is mere neurosis or frippery. I think this is a really, really bad moment. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to engage with that very seriously. So I think we have time for maybe a couple more minutes, is that right? Or should we move in? Okay. So you have created really incredible worlds in your fiction. And um, I love this. You once said of uh, Middle Earth, the creation of J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, that you find Middle Earth to be sociologically unconvincing as a world. Um, and in fiction, building, like world building, right? This craft of creating an entire universe, it's one of the most amazing things I think a writer can do. And you've done it over and over. So I'm curious if a knack for world building can translate into a knack for sort of observing the world around us. So what do you see out there right now that is sociologically unconvincing, that is, that is unsustainable, that something's got to give? And you've said you're, you're, you're highly pessimistic, highly motivated, highly engaged. What's, what's going to topple? What, what do you see is just, it just can't hold? <laughs> 
I, I wish for all of you that you never have your um, priggish, swaggering pronouncements from 18 years previously uh, <laughs> spoken. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's... Um, you can't do this to an old guy like me. This is really embarrassing. Um, uh, um, I... <laughs> We all have our punk moments. Um, <laughs> I don't even disagree with myself, I just cringe. Um, <laughs> in terms of... Uh, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a genuinely interesting question as to whether if you approach... I mean, to put it slightly more widely, that, that, that sense of if you approach the world aesthetically with a kind of fantasticating eye, so that you are trying to, which, you know, anyone who reads or writes or is interested in non-realist fiction or art, to some degree and in some ways is doing, whether that um, means that you, you, you have a, a particular kind of antenna for uh, the kind of, the, the, lived, the lived fantasies of everyday life, the, the points of, of tension and so on. Uh, my instinct is, is probably a very, very, very hedged yes. Um, but I really do want to stress that there are a lot of hedges there because there's a lot of people um, and, and ways of doing that that I don't think that holds for at all. Um, in terms of what's unsustainable, I mean, again, where do you start? I think one of the things that's, one of the reasons for this growing sense of apocalypse, which I, as I have said, I think is a real thing, and I'm not merely talking about climate change, but I certainly am talking about climate change. You know, this notion that like, uh, you know, well, you know, it was bad a few years ago and it'll be bad again and it'll get better. And it'll, Well, what if it doesn't? What if actually it just keeps getting worse? You know, because I do think we have to take that really seriously as, frankly, the most likely outcome right now. Um, and, you know, a few years ago, for example, with climate change, the left was saying, you know, we have to fight to stop climate change. Now, my position at the moment is we lost. That's done. Right? Now that does not mean, again, that what that doesn't mean is turning up your toes, you know, sitting down, never doing anything here. What it means is saying, it's happening, it's here now, it is going to keep happening, and what we are now fighting over is whatever is left. We're fighting over the ruins and the hope to make the ruins as least ruined as possible. Um, and I think we have to be very clear that to that extent, apocalypse has already started. In terms of political economy, one of the reasons we see this accelerating and deeply frightening move towards a kind of um, increasing circuit of extraordinary and explicit official social sadism in particularly the US but also in Britain and, and Europe in various ways. This, uh, you know, a fetishism for explicit cruelty um, is, I think, partly a result of the fact that since the, the early 1970s, capitalism's ability, you know, it, its combined ability and willingness to actually provide reforms have been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So the point is, the point is, even if it wanted to, which it doesn't, but even if it did, it, that, you know, there is within the system as it stands, the system of neoliberalism, there is much less space to provide these. And in the absence of that, and with the inevitable uh, and we can get into why that is, that's a whole bigger argument. And, uh, you know, in the absence of that, in the, with the inevitable, you know, rage and upset and, uh, uh, um, uh, and dishonor and, and indignity that that is going to create, what you have to have instead of, if you like, a social program um, is an oppression program. And there's always been both of those things, but what's happening at the moment is the balance between the social program and the oppression program is tipping hard and fast in the direction of the, of the oppression program with all of its kind of surplus cruelties and invested viciousnesses. Um, and this is ultimately unsustainable, um, certainly for anything approaching human dignity and life, and I suspect, ultimately, also for the system itself. Mm. I suspect, ultimately, you know, neoliberalism... I don't think neoliberalism can keep on being neoliberal in the way it is. The problem is, that doesn't mean that, therefore, it's all going to get better when it stops getting worse. It might just get worse and worse and worse and then just be terrible forever, if there's even anyone here. <laughs> which is why this matters and why... Which is why that kind of perspective of of kind of rigorous bleakness shouldn't, mustn't, and needn't necessarily mean quiescence or surrender. John Berger, the great, great John Berger, who was lost to us this year, had a phrase that he used when he was talking about Palestine. He said what he saw around him was undefeated despair. 
I challenge anyone not to feel despair, but that doesn't mean that you're defeated. So you're speaking about, you know, these politics of oppression, uh, these tough moments. I think one of the things that is somewhat terrifying, or at least gives a lot of uh, Americans at least pause, is the ways in which lately government and what we thought democracy was feels suddenly very vulnerable, um, somewhat fragile. And what I'm hearing from you is this mix of sort of pragmatism, just accept how awful this all is, but undefeated despair, like there's a hope there. So then what, um, we, we talked earlier about this, that there may not be that many places in the country that are more left and maybe more sort of friendly to the, to the socialist point of view than this one, right? We have a socialist on the city council, um, we have someone endorsed by the socialist party running for mayor, getting a lot of excitement behind her campaign. Um, Nikita Oliver. So, as a, as a city that, you know, this is Seattle. Seattle has a lot of heart. It has a lot of action behind it. Uh, a lot of agitation right now. I think the Washington Post called us the, the headquarters of, of the Trump resistance at one point, and you could kind of feel the whole city going, yeah, I know, that's pretty awesome. Um, what, what then would you advise people on the, on the left here in Seattle, how, how, do you, how, do, how do you channel that energy in the right ways to take, to, to go somewhere hopeful? Um, I can't, I mean, I, I can't talk about the specifics of Seattle. I'm not a Seattleite. What I can, what I can only say is that, and I don't in any way um, uh, uh, under, under, understate or underestimate the, you know, in, incredible work of, um, you know, the, you know, as you say, you have a socialist on city council. This is a very, very important and excellent thing. Um, um, what, I, what I would say, and I, 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 very much, I don't think she would disagree with me for a minute, I, sh I should add, is that um, these institutions, you can do excellent work within them, but it is not ultimately where fundamental change is going to come from. And this dovetails with what I was saying earlier about the, the, the institutions of liberalism and the, liber the liberal institutions. And so I think what I would say is, you know, ultimately the key thing is, um, is, is, is outside and external to those, to those, um, to those institutions. I do, I do not, I'm not someone who thinks, you know, if we can get, you know, if we can get a load of people kind of voted on then, you know, to, to these bodies, then, then that's the best way to fix things. I'm delighted if we can get people voted on as a sort of positive symptom of a mass movement that is not part of those institutions and that is pushing you know, from below, that is pushing on the streets, that is pushing in, in local organizations and so on. So I think my, the, 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 the thing that I would say is, you know, around the world is that you know, just be clear where power comes from and where change comes from. Change will not come from institutions that are, let us be very clear, constructed to obstruct change. Right? That's what they're for. These are machines to do this. And I think one of the things that is very important for radicalism is to stop thinking in terms of, if, if anyone still does, I don't want to parody, but to stop thinking in terms of putting the rational argument for you know, how this makes more sense. Because ultimately what we're talking about is a kind of implacable political opposition. And my go-to example here is the arguments about the American healthcare system. I have heard very many times, you know, people, liberals and people on the left, many of whom, for many of whom I have great respect and, and I don't wish to be, you know, personally snarky about, agonizing and shouting about the fact that the American healthcare system is broken and it doesn't work. It isn't broken, it works excellently. But if you think its job is to, is to cure sick people, then you're kidding yourself. You're it, not it going to fix it what's, what's by stressing that it's irrational. It's entirely <laughs> rational. Its job is to make certain people extremely wealthy, right? So, so you don't. <laughs> so, so that is, and, and you're not going to persuade. You're not going to change that by, you know, um, you know, by, by all manner of, um, uh, of 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 optimistic voting. You you might change it by a mass of people saying, healthcare is a right. This ends now. Mm 
Yeah, and not necessarily stopping where the institutions and the norms are because you just don't know if those institutions are upholding the very things that... I think you kind of do know that yeah. the institutions are upholding those things. So. Right. My question is about modern Russia. I'm going to have to make a statement first, which is, I think in the States we think Glasnost and Perestroika were great things, you know? Hey, Russia's better now, but it turned out that there was a massive transfer of wealth from its, its colossal natural resources are now controlled by a few, and it makes the the 1% and the wealth gap in other parts of the world look puny by comparison. Do you think, how are everyday Russians coping now and do you see kind of, uh, do you see it falling apart at the seams? Um, I certainly have no nostalgia for pre-perestroika and glasnost, glasnost Russia. I think that rather than, I mean to put it very crudely, I suppose rather than thinking, you know, one was good and one was bad, or that one was bad and one was good, I would say they were both differently forms of bad. But, the, but that moment of, of kind of, you know, the, 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 the change, the, the sort of, the, the, the sweeping away of that system, I think, uh, was actually, for me, quite inspirational. I remember when it happened, even though I was extremely, and as it turned out, unfortunately, um, right about the fact that it was not going in a direction that was going to particularly improve things. Uh, it was just going to make it different, a different kind of neoliberalized badness. Um, I, uh, I don't want to suggest they're identical. There's lots of very important differences, but um, I... I mean, I'm not an expert in Russia. I've been to Russia. I don't read Russian. I don't, you know, I, I don't pretend to. So I certainly, uh, I, I don't have um, a particularly perspicacious view on this. All I can tell you is the kind of reports from the people who I knew and know in Russia, which is um, essentially that, you know, it's, it's not great. I mean, you know, um, that one of the things about Putin, and this... One of the things about Putin is that not merely he is, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a cruel and um, uh, and extremely sort of um, uh, ruthless power player. He's also pretty good at it. He's very good at what he does, which is not the case with. I mean, Theresa May, for example, is a rubbish power player. She's really not very good at it. You know, she's she's she. You know, um, so there's you know there's those sort of twin axes of nasty and efficient, and I think Putin is both nasty and efficient um, at, at what he's trying to do. And there's no question that, um, you know, the, the, the voices for change, whether it's, you know, absolutely sincere liberal change all the way through to radical change are embattled, particularly in the latter case, the radical voices are very small and embattled. They're there, they're there, and they're doing in many cases, you know, fantastic work. But this is a, you know, this is, this is not, I think, unfortunately, um, a, a situation kind of on the brink of on the brink of change. I wish I thought it was. So Monica asked about the uh, sort of hope that the Re Russian revolutionaries had when they were staging their revolution of other countries sort of joining in. Um, and so, like China had overthrown its emperor in 1911. The Russia had its revolution. Um, the Irish sort of cast out England um, in 1917, 1918. So what do you feel like being a guy with a British accent uh, sort of insulated England from having the working class overthrow its oligarchy at the same time? Well, this is the perennial question for the English radical. Um, as, you know, um, <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of a joke in the sense that, you know, there is, there is if, you, if you go to a meeting in Britain, a political meeting, and, and someone talks about, you know, the English Revolution, even among kind of committed Reds, there's a kind of slightly nervous titter. The very idea can sometimes feel absurd. I think it's important, I mean, I, this is a huge topic. I think very briefly I would say, for one thing, it is absolutely not the case that, you know, there have never been serious, systemically shaking moments of radicalism in, in the UK and, and in England, uh, which, of course, are not the same thing. Um, and, and even, like, in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, you know, I mean, it wasn't Italy's red years, it wasn't, you know, the Hungarian Soviets, but there were mass strikes in England and they really scared the, you know, the powers. So it, it can happen. I think, the, uh, personally, I think that the, the specific reasons for, 
um, I mean, England is paradoxical in some ways because it, there are, there are, you know, we do have a social democratic tradition that, you, that on the whole you don't have, certainly at a mass level in this country, for example. Um, but I think there is something to be said about, analytically, for the fact that the, you know, the, the sort of English, uh, the English Revolution, you know, predates, you know, uh, by hundreds of years, uh, a lot of the sort of, the sort of, the ushering in of a new, of a new kind of society, you know, um, in the 17th century, um, I think actually created a sort of weird kind of uh, compromising um, situation between the kind of, the various ruling powers. Um, I mean, this, th I could go on for hours, and I'm not a specialist, so I don't want to do that. I think I want to say that I do think that it is, it is a glum fact that faces those of us um, in Albion that our politics are often, you know, we watch the French and we watch the Italian. I mean, not that things are great in France, let's be clear, but you see the kind of, you know, you see the, you know, the, the French farmers, you know, spreading shit all over the roads to, um, I mean, that's literally what they do with the fertilizer and so on, or the mass strikes or whatever, and you're sitting there going, oh, seriously, you know, like, we've got nothing, you know, uh, and we have, we have historically pitiful levels of strikes, but this again is the question of the, the 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 relationship between pessimism and 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 being energized because that doesn't you know uh, you know history is not eternal and if I if I genuinely thought there was no point then I would I would give up I think it is a particular result of our particular history and our place in Europe um, and it is uh, it makes one feel embattled but there are cracks in the carapace from time to time, and they're very exciting. And that means when we do have our Corbins, the hosannas, the excitements, that sense of, uh, one of our favorite words in salvage, sensucht, that sense of yearning joy is overwhelming, and that's pretty heady stuff. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the, uh, certainly all the fiction writing, all your writing, but the fiction writing, because I'm looking at the table here and I have nearly everything. That's actually leading to my question as well. Uh, during the reading uh, that you gave, and thank you, there were comments, there were uh, raising the question, discussing the question of the inevitability of the failure of the October Revolution, exchanging the head and the heart for the gloved fist and the jackboot. Um, I think one of, the, one of the fields that's rather intriguing is biohistory. Napoleon at Waterloo, for instance, for physical ailments. Had, had Lenin not died in January of 24, leading to the premiership of Rybakov and the rise of Stalin, he was only 53. He had another, one would hope, at least 10, 15 years before, to go. Therefore, the, the stewardship if you will, or the general, the general nudging along the proper lines of the October Revolution, and not the monstrosity it became under Stalin. As a fiction writer, what is your speculation? Right now, we go back the, the day before, we fix the cerebral hemorrhage, and let Lenin have another, yeah, Lenin have another yeah. 10 years. Uh, it's a great question. I mean, I, uh, I think I would have a kind of cautious, very cautious uh, optimism that certainly things might have been uh, less bad. I mean, just historically, you know, in, you know, as it sounds like this is a topic you know a fair bit about, I mean, like, you know, what's been described as Lenin's final fight, you know, was precisely against some of these tendencies that he saw rising. And he, and he says, you know, you've got to take Stalin out of his position as general secretary. He stopped, you know, you didn't trust him and so on. And he was ignored. And that's, you know, had he, and he still had a great deal of, uh, an enormous amount of kind of respect within the party and so on. So it's possible he might well have been able to, um, to, to operate as a break on some of that particular shape. Um, I do want to be cautious about it, though, for a couple of reasons. One is that I, you know, we, we, we mustn't be hagiographical. I mean, Lenin was an extraordinary man with an incredible kind of political antenna. He could certainly be wrong, um, and we, t even within his own terms, I mean, irrespective of whether you agree with him or not. And I talk about a couple of those in the book. Um, and he was, you know, from, from quite early in his political career, um, you know, his own comrades would very often sort of kind of slightly exhaustedly sort of say to him, you know, you're, you're, 
you're too rude about people. You need to stop this. You know, like he, he, his ruthlessness sometimes alienated people. There's a completely reasonable discussion about that. You could say, actually, no, under these circumstances, it was completely the only thing he could have done, and so on and so forth. Or you could say, actually, sometimes he was very unhelpful in his kind of unremitting approach. You know, when he argues for Shliapnikov and Kolontai to be expelled from the Bolshevik parties, I'm not going to defend that. I think that's a... And I'm glad he was... I'm glad he didn't win that, you know. So I think... The key question had to be the international question. It had to be what was going to happen internationally. Now, I definitely think had Lenin lived, he would have operated, particularly at that point, as a break on the worst excesses early on. I find it basically impossible to imagine him signing up to socialism in one country, for example. I may be kidding myself, I may be wrong, but I find that really hard to imagine. Um, um, but, there was only, this is, the, this is the least bad option question. There's only so much you can do if you really are an embattled state, you know, trying to forge socialism in, the, in, in, in a sea of capitalist enemies. So I certainly don't think he could have, you know, uh, saved socialism. What he may have been a useful part of is the kind of steering towards, one would hope, at least uh, a less bad alternative. And I think I, think I do cautiously think he would have been for, for precisely these reasons. I'm going to interrupt. Um, I have never seen so many people in line for questions. This is a good thing. Um, but we only have time for two more. Oh. If you have additional questions, um, China will be signing right here to your right, his left. And uh, books are for sale, um, house left, stage right over there. Thank you all for coming. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that we couldn't do more questions. That's partly because I tend to go on in answers. I'm sorry about that. So. Uh, but I will be around for a while if people want to ask things or discuss things, so please. Thank you. Well, uh, I have another fiction-related question. Um, so, as, um, as your, your own, whether your own politics have developed throughout your life and career or just the, you know, the tides of history to which you apply those politics has changed, uh, how does that, like, bleed into your writing? How do you apply um, developing political analysis to like a, you know, a fixed fictional, fictional framework that's going to stay on the shelf uh, for the next 20 years or much longer. <laughs> yeah, why, why do I get dispensed with after 20 years? I'm really... Um, <laughs> I was I'm, just I'm thinking about the one that came notion. out in 97. <laughs> um, I, uh, there's various different ways in which I can answer this question. I mean, for one thing, I, I, you know, I, 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 I think people worry much too much about, you know, how do you do fiction politically and so on. If you think politically, if you approach the world politically, I think one of the key things that you should do, not to the exclusion of all else, but is, is trust yourself, to trust your own subconscious to, to do the job that you want to do. Write the best fiction you can. Stop worrying about sending a message. I'm not suggesting you're saying that, but, you know, that's one thing. Um, so I... Uh, I do not know the reason for this, for what I'm about to tell you, so I can only offer it as a kind of anecdote, okay? But one of, for many years, um, you know, I, I, I like writing fiction, um, and it's the thing, you know, that gives me a lot of joy, as well as, you know, paying my rent and so on. Um, but I think for a long time I always had a certain degree of, of kind of guilt about it. I think, I think I found it very difficult because politics felt so urgent. It always felt like, you know, to a certain extent, you know, every piece of fiction you write is a piece of non-fiction, political non-fiction that you're not writing. And I felt, I felt a degree of guilt about that. One of the paradoxes for me, and I don't know why this has happened, but I'm very happy about it, is that in the last five, four to five years, as my politics have entered this, I think for me, very important new phase, not only have I felt more engaged with politics, not only have I been writing more political nonfiction, much of it in salvage, salvage.zone, please subscribe, um, but I've actually lost that guilt about writing fiction. And I feel, uh, I, what I don't want to suggest is, you know, writing fiction is an intrinsically political act and that's my activism. I don't think that at all. But I do think, I, I have somehow made a, a peace with the fact of, of, of that as a kind of, uh, you know, important kind of cultural expression, which I always had intellectually, but there was a nugget of anxiety in me which does seem to have dissipated. So 
the, the thing is, I can't answer your question. I can only offer an anecdote that, you know, to puzzle over. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I guess I got the last one then. Um, <laughs> well, let, okay. are you, do you have a question as well, right? Yeah, after why don't, why, uh, why don't we, you both ask questions. I'll see if I can kind of integrate I'll it and quick. we'll try and do it quickly, <laughs> okay? Uh, one of the um, themes in uh, many of your books, both fiction and nonfiction, as well as uh, the 1917 revolution and the modern era is the idea of left unity and what it will actually mm -hmm. take in order to get people to rally together around a central concept. And I think anyone who spent any time in Marxist discussion groups knows how fuel that can feel at times. Um, do you believe anti-capitalism is something we can rally around as kind of a nexus for building left unity? And if so, what would that look like? That's a great question. Oh, I, I'm, I'm interested in that question too. But I, I wanted to come up here because, and I'm really glad, uh, thank you for letting me come up here because I noticed that it was all white male and I said, you gotta let at least a female of color go up there. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, the, the reason I wanted to come up here is because I, I understand pessimistic, cautiously pessimistic, but I happen to be very optimistic. Um, and I've been a socialist, a member of the Freedom Socialist Party for 18 years, and I've seen a lot of changes in that 18 years. Uh, for example, um, I do think the left is gonna come more united. There's a, when I started off 18 years ago, you know, I was told, um, I, I didn't see the connections that, I, that the movements coming together, they were all fragmented. And it still is to some extent, but you're, staying, you're starting to see some changes, like um, there's times when I've come and, and raised um, my issues as a woman and say, oh no, that's divisive, leave those aside, or my issues as a woman of color, oh, don't bring race, there's no such thing as privilege, we gotta focus on class. And at the same time, I would go to the race liberation struggles and i say, oh, don't bring any cap, um, Marxism in here. In fact, that would erase my, my identity as a woman of color. But I'm starting to see that change. People are talking about connections. And, and so that is my question. That is where optimism comes, is from the bottom. And especially when I just made a recent trip to Arizona and my friends and relatives in conservative Arizona thought I was a little bit weird being a Marxist and a socialist and a revolutionary. And I was shocked when some of them said, oh, I'm starting to be open to socialism. And that's just me from just the rank and file, selling my newspaper out in the streets and trying to promote the ideas. And that's what I see my role as a revolutionary. And I think that's where you're gonna see the optimism. I just wanna know what your thoughts are and also on the left unity. Well, Thank you. Th th those aren't, I mean, this is going to sound tendentious and like one of those really labored um, things that, that, that people say, but in a way, I don't think those questions are so opposed. Um, because, um, I mean, I'm, I'm genuinely very glad that you feel optimistic. And I, I think for me, one of the things about pessimism is that the best kind of pessimism is a pessimism that attempts to disprove itself. You know, uh, if you are pessimistic on the left, you are always accused of wallowing in it and enjoying your despair. Au contraire, I would be delighted to, you know, disprove my own pessimism. And, 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 um, and the thing about it also is that, you know, when, when we're in these, these, these terrible moments, it's absolutely true that these, uh, you know, for me, apocalyptic moments are also highly politicizing moments. And that does, you know, lead to the sort of thing you're, you're, you're talking about. And we are in an incredibly volatile moment, and what that means is that, uh, you know, the oscillation between I, what, what for me is a completely appropriate political pessimism and these, you know, how can one not feel optimistic when, you know, you, you hear these, these sorts of things, or, or in my terms, you know, how can one not feel joy, that there's not really necessarily a contradiction about that. Um, I think I'm very skeptical of optimism as a programmatic position, um, which if what you're saying is I feel optimistic because of what I'm seeing, that's a different thing. Um, so I hope you're right, and I will be you know, striving to make my own um, you know, uh, bleak countenance wrong as much as possible. Um, and part of that, you know, instantly there's absolutely no need for any kind of sectarianism between uh, optimists and pessimists politically. We can all, you know, we can all march together and you can be going, we're going to win, and I can be going, we're going to lose. But, you know, we're still, we're still both going forward, you know, as long as I'm there, you know. Um, and and uh, in terms of, in terms of the, the kind of the question of left unity, sorry, I don't know where the question has gone. Um, 
it's, it's really hard, honestly, to be optimistic about left unity, particularly if you are, you know, for myself, I was involved in what felt to me like, you know, one of the, the, the key moments where there was a genuine potential shift about three and a half years ago. And it, it degenerated, as these things always have, because of, uh, because of certain kind of embattled um, nostrums and, and senses of, of kind of, for me, kind of political self-righteousness. I think... My glimmer of, um, of optimism, if you like, what I think it would take to really forge left unity is the frank acknowledgement on the left that it has lacked humility and the frank acknowledgement on the left that the algorithms it has constantly been applying for the last, in some case, 100 years are breaking down. We don't have the answers. One of the few, not all the answers, I'm not suggesting like our politics are all completely wrong, but the fact is there has been a phenomenon on the left for a long time which feels very nervous about uh, displaying any kind of kind of analytical weakness. Like if you don't have an immediate answer, you're not gonna persuade the working class. So any question that comes up, you have to immediately explain it. Never show surprise. As a leftist, you're never surprised by anything, right? Because you knew that was gonna happen because Marxism, right? Um, and thank God, one of the very few good things about, for example, Trump, is, you know, you can do an archaeology of left arguments over the last, uh, you know, however many months, 18 months or whatever, and they start off with all the well-read comrades going, will everyone please calm down, he's not going to be the candidate. Will everyone please calm down, he's not going to be the president. You know, the night before, you had the same thing from the opposite way with, with Corbyn. This is all great, but let's not get too excited because, you know, the institutions are too strong. Brexit, you had it with Brexit, you had, you know, Thank God what we may be seeing is the death of left know-it-allism. And that could be a genuine movement towards left unity because one of the key things that has collapsed it in the past is the sense that you disagree with me on this theoretical nostrum of mine, ergo you are a revisionist and we can't work together, or if I can't persuade you to my, my line of things. So I think for me, start, you know, I'm not wildly optimistic about this, I think a lot of these habits are very ingrained, but the best hope that we do have is by the necessary growth of left humility and the frank acknowledgement of socialist surprise. And that is why, for me, one of the key things to be taken seriously politically in the last year is if you're a socialist and you aren't prepared to hold up your hands and go, holy shit, did not see any of this coming, then I'm not gonna take you politically seriously. <laughs> All right, thank you so, so thank much, China. Thank you to everyone for coming. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.